the last lecture, we discussed the origins of agriculture in southwestern Asia. And we looked at some of the archaeological evidence for it. Very incomplete, but tantalizing, which suggests that agriculture began some 10,000 years before Christ. This lecture winges rather widely. We look at a variety of topics. We examine the causes and some of the consequences of this change from hunting and gathering to food production. First, I'm going to explore some of the major theories surrounding the beginning of agriculture. Also, some of the major factors that contributed to the changeover. In the second part of the lecture, I'm going to discuss some of the consequences of food production for human society and human history. And then finally, we're going to start what is in the next few lectures a fairly extensive bit of traveling, and we're going to examine the evidence for early farming in other parts of southwestern Asia and in the Nile Valley. So we're going to range rather widely here. Time frame, about 10,000 BC to about 6,000 BC, 4,000 years or so, but a very important 4,000 years in human history. What then about the theories of agriculture? Why did people make this change? We made a great play in the earlier lecture of the Younger Dryas, this thousand year period of near glacial climate in northern Europe which brought drought to the Near East. But is in fact drought the primary cause of agriculture? No. It's one of the factors involved. In the late 19th century, the first speculations about the origins of food production centered on the notion of a solitary genius who invented agriculture, who had, as it were, an aha moment, saw some plants germinating and thought, ah, I can do that, planted some seeds and presto, there was agriculture. People soon realized that this was nonsense. They realized that all hunter-gatherers know that when plants germinate and grow, it's part of the natural process of nature. They had an intimate knowledge of botany, not of Latin names, but of the uses of plants and their seasons. So it was realized pretty early on that farming began as part of a much more complex process that unfolded over many generations. And modern theories of the origins of food production focus very much on these processes, the mechanisms by which it happened. The best known of the early theories was that of an Australian-born prehistorian of great brilliance who spent most of his life in Britain. His name, Veer Gordon Child. He believed, and he was a fluent popular writer, who was widely quoted in the world histories that were so popular some years ago, he believed that there were two major revolutions in human prehistory. The first was an agricultural revolution. The second was an urban revolution, kind of like the Industrial Revolution of the 18th century AD. Child's agricultural revolution, he said, was a major economic shift which took place in southwestern Asia during a period of prolonged drought after the Ice Age. This drought, he said, caused a symbiosis, a coming together of potentially domesticable animals and plants and humans in the few surviving oases, like the Jordan Valley and the Nile Valley. And this in turn led to domestication and economies based on more reliable food supplies. Child's agricultural revolution captured the popular imagination. And you still see it popping up from time to time in the literature. But in reality, it was much too simple a formulation. Modern theories are based on the notion that people are generally culturally receptive to new ways of obtaining food. Why? It makes life easier. Modern theories also take into account something that I've emphasized a lot in the previous few lectures, is that many post-Ice Age hunter-gatherers were pre-adapted to 
agriculture and animal domestication. Why? They managed their environment to some degree and they managed their food supplies. They had to. Population pressure from growing local numbers, greater social complexity, and food shortages were all factors, we believe, in the changeover. So, with the complex interplays between short-term climate change and food supplies, the classic example, the younger Dryas, Abu Huraira, the shift away from forest food, nuts, to grasses. Ecological theories of the origins of food production, which are very popular, focus on such ecological factors as long-term variability in food resources and the effects of people interacting with their foods, managing them, extending their ranges and so on. And proponents of these ecological theories talk of quote-unquote opportunities for the introduction of agriculture. Like at Abu Huraira, where people used certain foods like wild wheat more intensively and eventually started planting them and extending their range and very rapidly domesticated them. The truth of the matter is that there is no one theory of the origins of food production which embraces all regions of the world. So much depended on local, cultural and environmental challenges. And ultimately, it wasn't ecology, it wasn't climate which really mattered. The ultimate key element, and the one that's hardest to identify, impossible to identify really, is that of human decision making. All of us, whether we're a family, a community, or an individual, constantly interact with one another and make decisions. And we always make decisions for short-term advantage. Very rarely for very long-term ones, although obviously, for example, investing in a certificate of deposit for 10 years is a long-term decision. But the short ones we make often have consequences we don't imagine. And people wonder whether the key factor ultimately in the adoption of agriculture were the people who made the decision to expand the range of a plant or to plant grasses. That decision or those decisions really were the ones that triggered everything else. But if you step back from that, it may have been cycles of drought that caused these people to say, okay, let us plant, we need food. So the interaction between ecological and social pressures the pressures of climate and everything else, the pre-adaptation towards permanent settlement, the population growth, all of these things come together or came together in this surprisingly rapid change from hunting and gathering to the production of food. And these new economies spread like wildfire. If there is any doubt as to the success of it. Just look how rapidly, and we will look at it, farming spread through the old world. Look how many different places it came into being. China, South Asia, Asia, Southwest Asia, the Americas, just to name four. Once established, these new economies brought major changes in their train, all of them having profound effects on the shape of human society. Let's look at a few of these. For a start, agriculture anchored people to their fields and caused them to live in permanent settlements for long periods of time. Not just a year or year round, like a hunter-gatherer base camp, but for generation and after generation after generation far longer than even the most enduring sedentary hunter-gatherer settlement. And this changed the dynamics of human life profoundly. Firstly, people lived cheek by jowl with others, across a courtyard, across a narrow alleyway, 
And people, as you know, can be volatile. We can fall in love. We can love or we can hate. We can be happy. We can be unhappy. We can be widowed. We can get sick. We can come to blows over the most trivial things. Now, in hunter-gatherer society, as I said earlier, you can move away. It's more flexible. But here, where you are living cheek by jowl with other members of your kin group and other kin groups, you must have ways of developing, conf resolving conflicts of all kinds, especially those involving the ownership and inheritance of land. So here's one major difference. How are you going to do this? What sort of leadership is needed? This is a very fundamental question which we'll come back to again and again. Then there's another one. Uh, when you're permanently in a village, you're anchored to your fields. You have to cultivate them. They're around your village. And the human relationship to the land, to the source of food, changes profoundly. Even in the most early of farming villages, there were signs of a new, much more complex relationship between the living and the ancestors, those who have gone before. Why? Because land ownership goes from one generation to the next, and it is a reasonable assumption that your successors will continue to cultivate the land as you have. And it's fascinating that almost immediately at sites like Jericho and Abu Huraira, you find for the first time ancestor cults. How do we know this? Take a look at this picture on the wall. This is a figurine made of clay from a site called Ein Ghazal in the Jordan Valley. It is a figurine that was once probably dressed with clothing and it's clearly a portrayal of somebody with eyes, a well-defined nose, there's paint on the body, and you find figurines like this or skulls plastered with the features of people who were living, ancestors, at a lot of these early sites. Clearly there was a relationship between the living and the spiritual worlds which was reflected in a relationship with ancestors. You find exactly the same thing in Native American societies, you find it in African societies. These relationships were all important. They were continuity. They bound you to the land. There are these spiritual relationships, very important. Again, the intersection of the living and the spiritual. Then there was another thing, and that is the issue of food surplus. Food surpluses were critical. You had to store not only the seed for the next harvest, for the next planting rather, and you also had to have enough food to feed everybody through the year. And these food surpluses and how you manipulate them began to play an important part in defining social relations. Who, for example, managed the food surplus at above the household level? Who made sure nobody went hungry? Who used surplus food to trade for other commodities? Critical issues in farming villages, much more so than in hunter-gatherer societies. And then there were the realities of the endless cycle of the changing seasons. These seasons bear much resemblance to the stages of human life, to birth, youth, adulthood, old age and death spring, summer, fall, and winter. The endless renewal of human life, of the fertility of the soil. Fertility of the soil and of human life began to play an important role in household and community life, manifested increasingly in earth and fertility goddesses. Now there's been a great deal of talk, uncritical talk, about mother goddess cults that were universal. I'm not talking about that. That's airy fairy nonsense. What I'm talking about is the fact that there are figurines of such deities, normally female, which of course embodies birth and fertility, 
which have close associations with agriculture found in some archaeological sites, among them a large village called Katalhuyuk, which we'll talk about, which is in Turkey, dating to about 6000 BC or earlier. There's a major material change, too. In earlier times, human technology had, for the most part, been light and portable. The microlith, the spear, the bow and arrow. Now people settled in the same place for long periods of time. They developed heavier artifacts, like fairly massive grindstones and mortars for processing foods, artifacts that had been foreshadowed in earlier, more sedentary hunter-gatherer societies. They developed much more sophisticated storing vessels, baskets and pots, clay pots, and durable buildings of mud brick, timber and thatch, designed to last not a year, but 15, 30, 40, 50 years, generations. The technology of storage became all important in a world where cooking and water carrying and the storage of grain were vital. And this led, after 6000 BC and earlier in some areas, to the development of baked clay vessels, pottery, the universal phenomenon of later archaeology. Very useful to archaeologists because the distinctive styles and shapes of vessels often chronicle major cultural change. There were more elaborate implements needed now for tilling the soil, not just simple digging sticks, but hoes with shell or wooden blades or stone blades, eventually of metal, axes with tough ground and polished edges for felling trees, and ultimately, after about 3,500 BC, the plough. And these new technologies, as well as the increasing complexity of village life, created a new demand for fine tool-making stone and other exotic materials. For example, volcanic glass, obsidian, which comes from fairly limited volcanic deposits, is lustrous and shiny. It's a wonderful product for making mirrors and very, very sharp stone tools. Today, even eye surgery has been done with obsidian blades. They're that sharp. And the trade in this expanded rapidly after 8000 BC. How do we know this? Because by using spectrographic analysis, we have been able to identify the actual locations, which are very limited, from which this material came and identify how far down the line from village to village this material was exchanged. But what I really want you to remember is the notion that we're talking here about an increased interdependency, the web of interconnectedness between different villages was beginning to expand. Because one of the major themes with urban civilization later in this course is the critical importance of long distance trade. So, obsidian and other materials and foodstuffs were handed from one village to another. And some settlements, like Jericho, like Katalhuyuk and Turkey, which we'll come back to in a moment, became major centers of trade in all sorts of commodities. How do we know this? From the exotic materials like seashells and obsidian in the deposits of these settlements. And finally, and there were of course many other consequences too, the role of women became better defined because they assumed major responsibility, not only for planting and harvesting crops, but also for processing grain. How do we know this? Because in Abu Huraira, a remarkable study of the leg and backbones of the female skeletons in the deposits have shown that these women show pathological conditions which result from spending enormous amounts of time kneeling over grindstones and pushing the heavy grinder. It's a condition found also in ancient Egyptian women. It's not found in the men. So there was real solid evidence here for the division of labor, which was to endure for centuries. These new farming economies 
spread like wildfire after 9000 BC. This was a highly effective way of living. It had the consequence of poorer diets, shorter life expectancy, more medical uh, problems because people were crowded into villages with limited sanitation, but it was successful. Within 2000 years, by 7000 BC, there was considerable variation in farming culture throughout southwestern Asia, not only in the Levantine corridor where so much began, but also in the Zagros highlands of Iran, in parts of Mesopotamia, and in Turkey. Between 10,000 and about 6,000 BC, agriculture developed and flourished in all these areas, as did the herding of sheep and goats. But it should be recognized that in these early millennia, people still relied heavily on wild plant foods and on game. Why? Because their crops were not that productive. But after 6000 BC, more productive cereal grains came into use and the domestication of two more animals, cattle and pigs, added to a fully agricultural and stock raising economy that was to persist in historical times in many areas in much more elaborate forms. By 6000 BC you had basically a fairly multifaceted subsistence economy over much of eastern Mediterranean and it was about to spread into Europe. This period was one of the most periods of the most profound social change in human society. The biggest change was the first appearance of some social ranking. Now this social ranking, even in small villages, must have been closely connected with the need to resolve problems, to regulate the distribution of food, and particularly to deal with such issues as the inheritance of land. The popular catchword for these people are headman or a chief. But one of the most powerful things in these societies, almost certainly, were kin groups. Groups who were descended from a common ancestor. And as social ranking in society began to be a factor, some of these kin groups or lineages became more important than others, wealthier than others, maybe were perceived to have superior spiritual powers. And it is from this kin leadership which was reflected in the communal ownership of land and the passing of land from one generation to the other that the first kin leaders or chiefs appeared. And it's a very interesting issue this whole thing, we'll get back to it again later in the course. But becoming a leader involves two things. One, it involves personal qualities, charisma. You can become a charismatic figure, an expert trader, a devout priest, whatever you wish. But then one day, having attracted all these followers, you die. And your following evaporates rapidly. It's rather like a rock star or a musician who dies. His following changes or evaporates. That's very different a sort of personal aggrandizer, a big man, as the literature often has called them, from somebody who inherits their office, a hereditary chief who passes the office to his son because he's in the same kin group and he is the natural successor because he's in the same lineage. It may have to be approved by the community, but hereditary office holding came in quite early. We don't know when, but I suspect it may have been in some areas as early as 6000 BC. Why do I think this? Because at Jericho, at Ein Gazelle and other sites, ancestors were revered and carefully preserved. There is, of course, as we saw here, the Ein Gazelle example. But the real issue here was continuity, leadership, and the relationship with the land. And legitimacy for leaders came from their links to revered ancestors, their membership in prestigious lineages. And this may have been the way that leadership came. 
But ultimately, the most successful were charismatic people, people with strong personalities who had the right credentials but also had great ability, like many of the pharaohs in Egypt late times, or some of the Maya lords, and so on. But here, you see the first signs of chieftaincy. So there were some consequences. So we'll look briefly at some other areas. The Nile Valley, the cradle of ancient Egypt, which we talk about a lot later in the course. Along the Nile Valley, rising sea levels after the Ice Age created a lush environment for hunter-gatherers along the Nile floodplain, because when you lift the river, the river which had a steep gradient obviously has to adjust. The result is flooding and the creation of a floodplain. These hunter-gatherers exploited both plants and fish very extensively. A few sites have been found. But unfortunately, the thousands of years of Nile floods have buried most of these settlements under fine river silt. As you know, each year the Nile flooded and the rivers rose and the waters spread over the floodplain, depositing fine silt and refertilizing the land. At the same time, the silt accumulates, burying ancient sites way under the alluvium. Generations of scholars have argued that agriculture was introduced to the Nile in, from southwest Asia, somewhere around 8,000 BC. But, by the same token, it's entirely possible that it began independently there. We don't know. One thing we do know is that drought was intensifying in the Sahara during this time. And during the Younger Dryas, when the Sahara got drier, they may have responded to a shortage of food by domesticating plants and animals on the edges of the Nile Valley as a safety net which protected them against an unpredictable environment. The truth is, we do not know when agriculture began in Egypt, but as we will see, village agriculture was the foundation of ancient Egypt. The earliest farming villages actually known from the Nile date to about 4300 BC, by which time villages of a considerable size were flourishing along the river and in the Nile Delta. These were the communities that were the ultimate foundation of ancient Egypt, which became a unified state in 3100 BC. Farming also began early in what is now Turkey, with agriculture, domesticated animals, and an obsidian trade well established by 9500 BC at sites like Halan Semitipisi in eastern Turkey. By 7000 BC, and the record is much better here than the Nile, well established large farming villages existed in central Turkey on what is known as the Anatolian Plateau. The Hasilar village was one settlement first occupied in about 8000 BC, a community of small roundhouses, each with their own ovens. But the most complex settlement of these was a village, sometimes called a town, called Katalhuyuk, also on the Anatolian plain. At its height, this large village, which is being excavated by an international team, covered 32 acres. It was a tightly packed community of flat-topped, sun-dried brick houses, with the outer walls of the houses serving as a defense wall. The village was rebuilt at least 12 times after 7000 BC, and is remarkable that some of the rooms of these houses served as shrines, with sculpted ox heads, wall paintings which depict vultures and the dead and ancestors, and relief models of bulls and rams. A rich community. Why was it rich? It came from its control of the local obsidian trade mined from quarries in the nearby mountains. Obsidian, interconnectedness, much more complex agricultural economies which were beginning to flourish over so much of southwest Asia by 6000 BC. In this lecture, We've looked at some of the theories surrounding the origins of agriculture, and we've examined something of the consequences of agriculture, to which we will return again and again. There was no one cause of the changeover. There were many different consequences, many of them which appeared long after agriculture came. Higher populations, denser settlements, more permanent settlements, new technologies, and major changes in social and ritual life.
And from there we established that agriculture was well established in the Nile by 4000 BC and Turkey by 6000 and we're now ready in the next lecture to explore agriculture in Europe.